بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قال الله تعالى في كتابه بعد عوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحديث حد محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد قال الله تعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا My dear brothers and sisters I begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the ability to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a blessing which actually many of us take for granted, for, take for granted daily thing that we, we do subconsciously, probably most of us in our prayers, maybe when we're giving thanks. I wonder whether we actually understood the power of praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I say that because I don't give khutbah very often. And the benefit of doing that is that whenever I do give khutbah and I say the statements that are so common to all of you that you're sitting here and you hear in Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu, and you're just hearing it and it's standard, you hear it every Friday, and I guess the body gets used to it, the mind gets used to it. Just like when you're praying and the Fatiha is recited. And the prayer, which should be an experience and a transformative experience, instead just becomes just a rite of passage. It just happens. It makes me smile when I think that it's the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam that one, when one finishes from the prayer, is to say Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Almost in an ironic kind of indication to just how much we failed in what should have been an opportunity to connect with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. And so when I say in Alhamdulillah, I don't say that very regularly because that is the official start of the Friday khutbah. But when I say it, I just wonder to myself, really do I praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly? Am I really aware of my praising Him? Do I know really and live really my thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I just say this is a random point of benefit to myself and to you. The reason I make this benefit, or this point of benefit, is so that when you leave this khutbah, one of 52 or the khutbahs that you will hear in, in, in a year, I would appreciate if you actually think about what was just said. As opposed to, it was Friday, went to Jum'ah, came back home, had lunch, just chill with that, it was, a, it was a holiday. I would rather that you think, you know what, I'd like to actually consider what was said. And if there's, and the message I'm about to give you, I think it's important, but more important than that message is what I just said now. Just to think about how you praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just say it at least once with meaning. If you say Alhamdulillah once with meaning, I swear to you by Allah, I swear to you by Allah, you will have done something so huge, you will struggle to be able to understand the magnitude of it. You know why? The Prophet wasallam said in a hadith narrated by Ibn Majah and it is Sahih that my slave did not give back to me when he said Alhamdulillah for something that I have given him except that what he gave back to me was more than what I gave him. Let me explain that again to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings are infinite, millions. 
They can't be counted. لا تحصى. They are not. You can't enumerate them. Whether you think about the, the blessing of breathing, sight, eating, safe passage, when you're traveling, a roof over your head, a smile when you walk in, not tears, a child who gives khidmah of you. The blessings you can start and carry on counting. All of those blessings the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah has given to you, if you genuinely and sincerely say, Alhamdulillah, just that statement, Allah has said that what you have given to Allah as saying, Alhamdulillah, is more than every single thing that Allah gave you. Wallahu Azim, that's mind blowing. For the human mind to comprehend that kind of level of mercy, it's just absurd. It doesn't make sense to the human paradigm because we understand transactions on the base of I give you something and you give me something back of equal value. Okay, fine. In business, I give you something and you give back a little bit more than the value. We call it profit. We're happy. But we don't understand me giving you a loaf of bread and you paying me a billion dinars. That doesn't make sense. Yet this hadith has ex expressed that kind of paradoxical reality where all we say is Alhamdulillah and everything that Allah has given to us, we've actually repaid Allah more than that. This hadith is authentic. If you're struggling to understand what it means, first of all, just accept the hadith first of all. Secondly, why don't you, while you're still struggling to understand, try to achieve a state in your life where you do thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala properly. Where you do sincerely stop everything that you're doing just stop and you think Alhamdulillah. Allahumma lak alhamd. Allahumma lak alhamd. I make this point upon the hamd specifically because of what I want to speak to you about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, O you who believe, save yourselves and your family from the hellfire. Save yourselves and your family from the hellfire. Our family has different levels. We have the immediate family, which is referring to our own children and our parents. And then you have the extended family, which then by order of priority includes our brothers and our sisters, and then our uncles and our aunts, and then those which go across and then to the side and then down. And maintaining all of these ties and keeping in contact with them and serving these people and being good to them and, and every type of khair, every type of good, every type of sacrifice that you can do for their behalf is called Silatul Rahim. Maintaining those ties. This is the source of all good in life. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that the one who wants to have barakah in his rizq and increase in his provision and an increase in his life, then let him maintain the ties of kinship. Yani, establishing the ties, establishing the family, making a strong unit has a direct impact upon you as an individual in how blessed you are in your life and in your akhirah. And that itself has a key role in how successful the community will be. Because the people who are maintaining a tight, Quality relationship at home will mean that they will be able to ensure a quality and tight relationship in society and the community. So the success of the community is based upon the success of your family. My brothers and sisters, in this short reminder, I just want to give you three key tips to help raise the most important aspect of this family, which is your children. I want to tell you that there are three points if we look out for in our children, you will not only make the process of child rearing and culturing and cultivating easier, but you will educate your own self, your own self on these three very Islamic principles. The first of them, the ability to be able to focus on that which is not just what you're interested in. What do I mean by that? When you raise your child from a very young age, you will see that they have an incredible, incredible ability to be patient with very few specific things. When they're very, very small, you pass them the rattle to keep them quiet. In this inane, mundane, and in next hour, all they will do is just shake this rattle. You can't hear it for more than 10 seconds, you wanna go away. But they will just hold it and they'll shake it and shake it and shake it. Observe the baby. They have the ability with very few things to be able to have a lot of patience for a long time. TV, 
Stick them in front of a TV channel, it doesn't actually matter what's on TV. As long as the pictures are moving, as long as there's sound coming out, you can stand in front of them, dance up and down, you can put your hands in front of them, they don't move, they don't see anything, they don't hear anything, they are super focused. That is the ability of the child. What's fascinating of course, is that this ability of being able to focus on certain things is actually linked to our desires. Let's move into the adult zone. Adults, we know, as, li- as, as Muslims especially, that we have a purpose in this life to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if worship was so easy, then we'd do it naturally. But we don't. You agree with that? We don't. Because when the Prophet ﷺ went to take the prayer from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how amazing is that story of course, considering of course that this is, we're in the holiday of Al-Isra wa Al-Mi'raj, okay? And if you want me to bring a little Isra wa Al-Mi'raj yani angle in, let me do that. Of course the Prophet ﷺ was given the prayer on this day, or on this night. And when he was given this prayer, the Prophet ﷺ in his newness to the job, because he was new Prophet, when he went to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he was given 50 prayers to pray, he was delighted with that. It was like, this is an amazing deal. I got to meet my Lord, I went through the heavens, I saw all of my brothers, I saw these incredible people, and I've been given a gift by Allah. I've been given a gift that when he came back, he's very happy to speak to Musa alayhi salam. You wouldn't believe 50 prayers. Musa is like, hey, I just want to tell you that you're not going to be able to handle 50 prayers. Your nation will not be able to handle that. Go back and ask for a discount. Let's try and bring that down, something more manageable. And then in the authentic hadith that we know, we see a narrative played out which is nothing short of amazing. We see the Prophet ﷺ go back and forth, back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, back down each time very happy, receiving 10% discount each time, 45, 40, 35, 30, each time coming back, each time being told by Musa alayhi salam, trust me, been there, done that, your nation will not be able to handle this, keep going back, keep going back. Out of respect to his older brother, he keeps going back. And when he then eventually comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the, the number on 10, the Prophet ﷺ says, is it possible for a reduction? Then it is as Allah has said, it is five and it is 50. I give you five prayers every day, five times a day, but its value will be 50. What's fascinating about this, think of the psychology, is that <clears throat> There's so many things, I didn't even know where to start actually, but let's first of all, look at how incredible the process is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intentionally put the Prophet ﷺ through this. You might, normally, you might normally say this is a game. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course knows that He's gonna give a number and that the Prophet's gonna come back and He's gonna reduce it and He's gonna go and then He's gonna come back, right? So Allah knew that. So we need to think then, what was the wisdom behind Allah putting the Prophet ﷺ through that? Well the answer is clear. It's so that the Prophet ﷺ himself can appreciate the value of the prayer. Because otherwise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could at the first time just said there's five prayers. Because that's what he was going to do, right? He was going to give five prayers. He could have just done that, but he didn't. He made the Prophet ﷺ go through the process so that he lives the struggle and feels the value of the prayer. Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said it is five, but it is fifty. So now when we come back to earth and the Prophet ﷺ is teaching his companions to pray, it doesn't need the kind of fake rhetoric to try and big up the prayer. He doesn't need to big up the prayer because you know what? He knows the value of the prayer. I've just been to heaven back and forth. I just got it reduced from 50 to 5. I know the value of the prayer. And his companions, they saw that from him. They saw in, in, in the actions of the Prophet Wasallam and in his prayer, in his prayer, they saw this is a man who's connected to his Lord. What's the, 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 the other benefit from this? That actually our, our natural state, our day-to-day full actions is not to pray. Our body is not made for 24 hours a day prayer, which was what would have had to happen if we had 50 prayers. If we had 50 prayers a day, we would have had to have then been praying all the time. But it's not. As the Prophet ﷺ said to Abdullah ibn Amr, he said that your body has a right upon you, your family has a right upon you, your wife has a right upon you. Meaning there's meant to be times where you're chilling, when you're enjoying, when you're sleeping, when you're eating, when you're having relations. What's the fascinating lesson from that? 
is that therefore this describes a human being as a, as a, as a being who is struggling with his desires and his priorities. The desires are to sleep, priorities to wake up and pray. The desire is to eat, but the priority is to fast because it's Ramadan. The desire is to stay at home, the priority is to make the journey to Hajj. The desire is to look after the family, the priority is to go out and defend the borders. The, the, the desire is to enjoy time and relax and watch this and do that and enjoy and play. The priority is to learn and to study and to help people and to sacrifice. Life is a constant battle between desires. Things that we want to focus on, things that we should be focusing on. This lesson starts by teaching our children early. When our children are given the rattle and they play with it, what they are exhibiting is their focus on a very small set of desires. When they focus on the TV, the same. But your children will be growing up soon and going to school. Your children will be growing up soon and need you to teach them Quran. And you know what? They don't want to go to school and they don't want to hear the Quran and they don't want to be taught about the deen. Because that's not the things they want to focus on. Which is why when they are young, lesson number one is to start with the non-obvious things. Start with the skill of ensuring your children are able to focus on things that they're not interested in. I repeat, developing your children the skill to focus on things that they're not interested in. Because soon, by the time of six and then seven and then ten, other people will have other things that they want the children to focus on. And if they're unable to leave what they desire, because you allow them to enjoy that for so long, it will be all the more difficult to be losing that concentration for that, that focus on that, and moving into something else more beneficial. The second tip that you should practice as a parent, and again, as we just gave the example before, take the benefit as an adult. It's the principle of doing to other people like what you want for yourself. As a child, you will see that the basic principle is me. When you give the toy, the, 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 the child the toy, they want to play with it, they don't want to share it. Food, toys, games, activities, time at the table, time at the sport, me, me, me. And this carries on. The earlier that you are able to instill in your child the concept of sacrifice, the concept that there are other people that need to be happy just like you need to be happy in order for the community to be happy, is a skill and a characteristic which you must bring into your children early. And of course this is a religious dini principle as well. To do unto others like you would do unto yourself. To treat others like you want to be treated. Speak to others like you want to be spoken to. This Islamic concept will be born out of you introducing the principle to your children of being able to share with others. You will find some of the most brilliant children, some of the most well-behaved children, they have a problem in sharing with others. They have a problem in, in working with groups. Schools are not just some kind of, you know, something which is just made in, in the corner out of, out of nothing. It's concerning, it, it is based upon educational psychology, years of experience and observing that it's important that children work in groups and share things because this affects their development later. And this is best illustrated in my final point, number three. The concept of instant gratification versus deferred gratification. What am I talking about? We're talking about principles which we start when they're young, which if they understand when they're young will ensure a positive life afterwards. This third principle is something which has been best illustrated in a study, a very famous study that was uh, held in the 70s. Some researchers gathered a, uh, a group of four-year-old children. They said to the four-year-old children that we're now going to take you into a room one by one. In this room, there's a table. On the table, a plate, a plate of marshmallows. I beg your pardon. A plate with a single marshmallow. You're going to go into this room. I just want you to hang around here. Just wait. I will be back in about 15-20 minutes. And if you can wait for me, there's a marshmallow there, you're free to eat that. But if you want, if you, can, if you can wait for me, when I come back, I'll bring you a whole plate full of marshmallows. So all of the children then were, were one by one led into this room. As you can imagine, the majority of the children, they waited, hang around, got bored, look at the, look at the marshmallow, pop the marshmallow, and end the story. The, the researcher comes back, marshmallow's gone, okay, you had your 20 minutes, you had your instant gratification. So you had your little sabr, you took your immediate reward, khalas, see you later. A few of the children, they held out. 
They looked at the instant gratification, they had the patience, and they were happy with deferred gratification, the one that comes later, the reward which comes later, gratification meaning reward. The researcher then for those children bought in a full plate, it was Eid, mashallah, they knocked it all out. Had a great time. The researchers went back to the same control group of children 20 years later. At the age of 24, to see according to life measures, quality measures, just how much or not these children have developed in life, in social skills, in business, in education and so on. The life quality achievements on the parameters of normal, normative societal anthropological basis showed that that small group of children were far more successful, more professional, more well off, more well integrated in society than those that had taken the instant hit. What's the lesson brothers and sisters? Is it haram to take instant gratification? No, it's not haram. But is deferred gratification better for you in this life? Yes. Question, is it better for you in the akhirah? Absolutely. What else is Islam other than the ultimate deferred gratification? What else is Islam other than being left to wonder and, and experience and explore life? Go through a number of challenges and experiences and every moment in every day you have the opportunity to gratify yourself. And when I say gratify, I'm not talking about the halal things of normative food, but I mean you could do things which the body really loves. You know what the body really loves? Really, really, really loves? What we call the base desires, the carnal desires. The things which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made haram, not because they are ugly or disgusting, but because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees that the test is stronger in them. Think about it. Think about about the things that your ulama do not want you to do. Drink alcohol. You may think alcohol is disgusting and smells bad and has a bad effect. Actually, look at some of the high class drinkers of some of the more expensive types of wine. Very beautiful drink. Some of the Baileys and cream version would rival milkshakes. The experience afterwards of the euphoria. Look at drugs and the amount of uh, relaxation that they would bring to the mind. Think about zina, the most powerful emotion that um, any man, any man will ever go through, the sexual desire, the one which the Prophet ﷺ has specifically said that I have not left behind me, a greater trial. Why would it be a greater trial? Because it's the one that the body desires most. I have not left a greater trial upon my ummah than the ummah of women, meaning their beauty, meaning an illegal relationship. All of these have been music, for example. Who's brave enough to say that I hate music because it sounds rubbish? Who says that? Who says music is? Who, who actually thinks that music doesn't really sound nice? Remember, it might be some dodgy rock stuff, yeah, somewhere, yeah. But some of our own culture, some of the nice stuff that we know. Why is it that we've been pushed away from all of these things? Because my brothers and sisters, not because they are ugly or, or by their own nature that they are something which we don't desire, it's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the haram for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a reward which is more than just a plate of marshmallows for pushing this single marshmallow away. Whether it's the zina, whether it's the alcohol, whether it's the drugs, they are haram, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it haram. But Allah is teaching you a lesson. This deen, this life is not about instant gratification because if you want, then you know what? You live the life of YOLO. You only live once and then you just go out there and you enjoy yourself. But you know what? Muslims don't, don't live once. We live twice. This is the minor life and the real one is to come. And so therefore we don't fall for the trap of instant gratification. Iman is deferred gratification. Why is it that no one will be accepted their tawbah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows the sun to rise in the west? Why? Why when the sun rises in the west, tawbah is finished? No one now can become Muslim anymore. Because at that moment, at that moment everyone will now know that faith has lost its meaning. Iman loses its value at that moment. Because Iman is patience. It's us believing in Allah and willing to sacrifice our lives for Him, not seeing Him. Not seeing Him. This is our faith. It's our trust in everything that Allah has sent. That it's true. He is true. And the Jannah is true. And Jahannam is true. And the Da'awah is true. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala suddenly shows us with our own eyes that the hour has started, and then you turn around and say, well, I believe in Allah now, and I make sajda now. But it's too late now. 
Deferred gratification is a principle of life for adults, not just children. My brothers and sisters, reflect upon these three points. If you are able to bring into your children these three, and especially the third, the ability to be able to do good without always having to expect a reward for it. The ability to inspire your children to do it for the sake of Allah, which is so difficult. The, the environment at home, where little rewards here and there, little sweets, little chocolates, little achievements for a little bit of memorization or good behavior, is only that, little, little rewards, not the big reward. You don't want them to memorize for your sake, or you don't want them to memorize for the big toy at the end, or the big prize, or the big holiday. These are side things. You make it out to be side little bonuses. You instill in your children that the real reason you're doing it is so that you can go to Jannah. This will develop all of the positive characteristics that the believer needs, where he throws and shuns away instant gratification and takes on deferred gratification, which is just another synonym for the word Iman. My brothers and sisters, reflect upon this. أقول قول هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. بسم الله والحمد لله ولا نعبد إلا إياه والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. My dear brothers and sisters, um, it's often difficult for a Muslim to look at situations around the world where people are suffering for whatever the reason, whether it's natural or political or military or whatever and injustice and so on. And Friday is normally the day where people kind of spare a thought, right? And normally the khatib will make a dua and you will feel a bit guilty and you say ameen, and you say ameen. And I want to say to you that this is the kind of superficial interest which is not, deserve, not becoming of Muslims. If your contribution to their state is your little ameen on the khatib's dua, then I just want you to question whether you are actually acting like a brother of the brothers and sisters who are suffering in whatever way they are. I want to say to you that with a clear focus on the objective and with a clear understanding of your role, you can be more meaningful to the entire ummah and its problems. Never ever belittle the acts of good that you do. Never ever belittle the acts of obedience that you have been commanded to perform. Everything has a significance in the wider game. You might not be able to see it, but just because you are not able to go out and donate as what you would like and go and help support and fight and defend people that you think need helping and fighting for and defending, doesn't mean that you're useless. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created an incredible amount of people. And these people need developing. The societies need structuring. And the little bits of developmental work that happen from the home, from the home in every corners, in every corner of the world, in every, commu in every community, in every country, is all part of a wider plan to bring blessing back to this nation. The state of this nation and its condition is linked to its individual parts. Don't you worry about the sum of the individual parts. You worry about your responsibility. Focus on those things which you are able to do if you have the ability to go and have political power and lobby and raise money for on the wider scale to help others, that's great. But the majority of people, it's just not realistic. They need to concentrate on earning halal. They need to concentrate on not turning their children away from Islam. They need to struggle and ensure that their children don't just memorize the Quran like this, like this, like this, and not knowing anything what it means, but that they actually want to connect to the Quran. They actually get excited by the Quran and what it promises. Wallahi, if you achieve this, this in your life, you have done a great service to the Ummah, because through that action, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send blessing down. And it's only through His blessing that we are going to recover from the state that we are in. If you somehow think that 50 years of all of us all preparing is suddenly going to make us an, a nuclear international world power where we have the world's biggest armies and the biggest power, it's never going to happen. I can tell you right now, the words of Sayyidina Umar are timeless. You will not beat them with your military power at all. The only way that you will beat them is with less sins, with closer taqwa, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if He wants this to operate in a military way, if He wanted us to win, He would turn up the, the ground like this and He would bring it down. Khalas, it would be all over. It's clearly not about that. Think, reflect upon the reality of your life. Think and see just how it could end so quickly, but Allah doesn't end it. Which proves that this is about you and your responsibility in your own areas. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to worship Him in the best possible way. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the tawfiq to raise our families in a way which is pleasing to Him and according to the sunnah of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring ease to our brothers and sisters who are suffering around the world, in the west and in the east and in every part where your name is mentioned. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send peace and blessings upon His Messenger and to bless us with His following and to bless us from not going astray from that sunnah of a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our brothers and sisters who have preceded us in Iman and to not allow in our hearts anything from al ghil and envy and hatred to be in our hearts. Because indeed, Allah, you are the forgiving, you are the merciful. Establish the rose and establish the prayer.